Well, That's for those right. of you that don't know me, Dave Newhart, president of the Yellow Springs Historical Society, uh, we welcome you all here on a cold day in January to our first program of uh, 2024. We've got a whole slate of programs we're going to roll out this year, so that ought to be a uh, great time. Keep keep uh, watching your mailboxes for the purple cards and the in the newspaper uh, for announcements. Um, I think this is going to be a, a program of very much interest to everyone here because all of us have been driving up and down 68 and seeing that, yeah, seeing this uh, wonderful building uh, going up. And I think we'll hear a little bit of the story and we'll try to pin these folks down on exactly when it's going to open. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so uh, I really do uh, welcome everybody. I'd like to, um, this is making it easier on me, and we've got some, some uh, fairly, uh, uh, fairly interesting people in our audience who will get introduced here, I'm sure, at some point. But uh, I only have to make one introduction, and that's Melissa Clark who is the regional, Southwest Regional Director for Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And as I think everybody knows, this is a Ohio Department of Natural Resource project. And she'll introduce the rest of the crew that's here. Well, thank you, Dave. Thanks. Well, thank you all for coming out on this chilly January afternoon. We really didn't know what to expect as far as a crowd, and this is a fantastic turnout. So we really appreciate you coming out to listen to us. We're super excited to tell you a little bit about this project that you're all wondering about. Um, and so I will uh, introduce my team here under Director Mertz's leadership, and she is with us this afternoon. Thank you. Um, she has put together a fantastic team, and this is just a fraction of the people that it has taken to pull this project together. I, I, don't even, I, I couldn't even begin to count the number of people involved. Um, but today, like I said, I'm Melissa Clark, and I'm the Southwest District Manager for Ohio State Parks and Watercraft. I oversee 13 state parks, soon to be 14 with Great Council, um, and this is part of our team that's been working on this. This is Brant Folks, and he is our Capital Projects Manager for Southwest and Central Ohio. And we, I will let them tell a little bit more about themselves when they talk, but Tim Pritchard, who is our Park Manager for John Bryan and Great Council State Parks. He is uh, fairly new to our team in the last couple of months. And then this is Talon Silverhorn, and he is our National Supervisor, leading the interpretation, and he's a fantastic um, storyteller, historian, and you will really enjoy hearing what he has to say today. So thank you for coming out, and we will get on with the presentation. Um, sounds great. You want to kick off the Sounds good. Would you all prefer that I use a microphone, or can everybody yes. hear me? Yes. Use a microphone? All right. <laughs> is this better? Yes. All right. It sounds good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Talon Silverhorn. I'm a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe, and I'm a natural supervisor with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Um, we're going to talk today about Great Council State Park. I'm going to kick this off, and then we're going to kind of take turns talking about different parts of the project. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the history of the site, um, kind of the, uh, the historical interpretation that we're trying to bring to life at Great Council. Um, but uh, just to kind of briefly introduce myself, one thing I always make a point to do is introduce myself in my own uh, language, in someone what do we mean? So I would say, Hado. You don't say Hado. Hado. Hako is a lasamomo, Neho is a lasamomo, Quakula, Nilasamo, Yellow Quaki, a poxim, and Kieta Kuthaki, Miami, Oklahoma, the way that Oklahoma, Te Kalkila, and also Holy Monaco, Nitasigo, Nika Kiri Silverhorn, Tino, without Clint Silverhorn, Te Kokochi, Teresa Blue Jacket, Te Soma, Lance Silverhorn. Did y'all get all that? <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, um, what I told you essentially was kind of a formal introduction. I started real broad, told you what nation I was from, and then I told you what clan, where I was born, who my mother and her mother, my father and his father is. Uh, and kind of just like that introduction, a lot of what we're doing uh, when we're telling people about Great Council State Park is starting broad. What is it? Where is it going to be? When's it going to open? Um, <laughs> things like that. We're kind of narrowing in on something. And what we're going to start is quite a long time ago. Um, we are going to start in the 18th century, uh, where largely the interpretation of Great Council sits. So, 
we're going to kind of bounce around, but we're going to follow at least a rough timeline. At the end of the Seven Years' War, um, this is the mid-18th century, 1750s, 1760s. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. But just to kind of get things rolling, um, some points that are important to the story of Great Council and to Ohio as a whole. Uh, in 1763, uh, this proclamation right here uh, was made October 7th, 1763, um, proclaims that any Indian lands west of the Allegheny Mountains are off limits to settlement. Um, this is important because obviously Great Council is west of that line. Uh, it denies a pension requests to request uh, for lands uh, west of that line. A lot of people who fought in the war uh, were promised land as part of their payment for their services during the French and Indian. Um, obviously, Lord Dunmore's War and other conflicts that come later are trying to recoup those promises. Uh, and it establishes stricter trade regulations with tribal people, like Shawnees, Wyandots, uh, Miamas, and Delawares, and anybody who's living west of that line. Um, there's kind of a rough sketch of that line. This is a, a correct map of North America. Uh, it was made just at uh, the end of this, or just at the beginning of the French and Indian War. And you can see here that yellow dot, I don't know if you guys can see it, but just right here, that yellow dot, that is the previous Chillicothe town to the one that we are talking about today. The blue dot is roughly where Old Town is today. That's our Old Chillicothe town 1777 to 1780. So this was a Shawnee town. Now this image is the only documented pre-1800 image of a Shawnee person that we have. Um, there are a couple that kind of claim to be images of Shawnee people from around Detroit, but haven't been able to track down any solid documentation for those. Now this uh, image comes from a map made in 1796 by a man named Victor Colo. Uh, a general course of the Ohio River was the name of that map. And uh, to give you an idea of kind of what this man is wearing, I think Jay Carver has a really good description here. He says that the men of every nation differ in their dress very little from each other, except those who trade with Europeans. These exchanges for their fur, uh, these exchange their fur for blankets, shirts, and other apparel, which they wear as much for ornament as necessity. They throw their blanket loose upon their shoulders, and holding the upper side of it by the two corners with a knife in one hand, uh, tobacco pipe, uh, tobacco pouch, pipe, etc. in the other, and thus accoutred they walk about in their villages and their camps. And you can see that's kind of exactly what's being described here. So life in uh, this part, the latter half of the 18th century, trade is extremely important. Uh, everything that this man is wearing is from Europe or Africa or Asia. Um, the only native made thing he's got on is his moccasins, essentially. So. Now, this is really where the story of our Old Chillicothe begins. Old Chillicothe, or in Shawnee, Chillicothe, um, <laughs> is a series of towns. It's not just one place. And I'm sure most of you kind of are familiar with that fact. Um, this is a kind of a seat, if you will. Um, this is something that there's always a Chillicothe town, and uh, it moves around from place to place, from Virginia to Maryland to West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Kansas, and Missouri. Um, I mean, there's lots and lots of Shawnee-built Chillicothe's. But on November 10th, 1777, um, the leader of the previous old Chillicothe town was killed. That was uh, Hokule Esquat, or Chief Cornstalk. And this is a contemporary painting that is at the, uh, uh, the Fort Randolph site at Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Uh, now, but this kind of depicts that scene. I have a quote here from the uh, one of the soldiers that was present um, from his pension uh, request. He says, at the fort were regular soldiers, many of whom were marched elsewhere on the company of rangers, um, that he was one of the guards over the celebrated Indian chief Cornstalk, that when he was murdered, November 10th, 1777, uh, he, this affiant, did all he could to prevent it but that it was all in vain. The Americans, exasperated at the depredations of the Indians, broke through the guard and killed the said prisoner of Cornstalk. So that was from a pension application of Jacob, Jacob McNeil. Um, and uh, he was present and guarding uh, the building that Chief Cornstalk was staying in. And his son. There were several people there. 
Uh, that is the village site previous to ours on the Sayado River. So this is uh, um, Felix Rennick's map of the Pickaway Plains that was made a little bit later on, but it's a good representation. Where you can see Cornstalkstown um, and uh, his sister's town just below there. And then just right on that river, uh, with a road leading directly to it, you can see Old Town or Chillicothe. Hmm. That is uh, the previous one. And just north, just cut off above where the map uh, ends, is actually the Circleville Mounds. So if that gives you any idea of where this is specifically. So once Chief Cornstalk is killed in November of 1777, uh, Chief Blackfish kind of assumes the leadership position of this particular town. And Cornstalk was a advocate for peace. And if he can be killed, anyone can be killed at this point. And so um, to prevent further attacks from Virginia and Kentucky, Chief Blackfish at some point uh, moves that community far to the west. He moves it to the Little Miami River. And this is really where our old Chillicothe begins. So David Jones, uh, the Reverend David Jones, writes a lot about his travels through the Ohio country and of Shawnee people. He says that the Shawnees are an active and sensible people, not possessing a dull imagination and some kind of scripture or hieroglyphics. Uh, the false faces used by their manitos of their own formation. Uh, they're the most cheerful and merry people that I ever saw. The cares of this life, which are such an enemy to us, seem not to have yet entered their mind. It appears um, that the men and women laughing exceed any nation that ever came under my notice. So, he traveled a lot through many different communities. He actually did stop at the previous old Chillicothe. He never made it to uh, Chillicothe on the Little Miami River. But this gentleman did. Uh, Daniel Boone, in uh, February of 1778, he uh, eventually made a stop here at Old Chillicothe. So he says, at Chillicothe, I spent my time as comfortably as I could expect, was adopted, where I became a son, and had a great share in the affection of my new parents, brothers, sisters, and friends. I was exceedingly familiar and friendly with them, always appearing as cheerful and satisfied as possible, and they put great confidence in me. I often went hunting with them and frequently gained their applause for my activity at our shooting matches. The Shawanese king, Chief Blackfish, took great notice of me and treated me with profound respect and entire friendship, often entrusting me to hunt at my liberty. I frequently returned with the spoils of the woods and as often presented some of what I had taken to him, expressive of duty to my sovereign. So Daniel Boone, along with about 26 other men, was captured on February 8, 1778, uh, at the Salt Licks um, in northern Kentucky, just below Chillicothe, or I'm sorry, just below Cincinnati. Um, Daniel Boone's men were ransomed. They went to Detroit. Daniel Boone himself went back to Old Chillicothe with uh, the Shawnee party that captured him. I'm digging into some stuff right now. Um, I saw a mention that Pierre Lormier, uh, or Peter Loramy, as some might know him, um, was actually present during uh, the raid that captured Daniel Boone. So I'm trying to go through the French journals um, that Mr. Lormier left and find out if that is actually true. Um, but he stayed until about um, June 16th, 1778, when he learned, he came back from a salt boiling expedition with the Shawnee, realized that they were planning an attack on Boonesboro, uh, and left uh, of his own accord early, early morning uh, of June 16th. Thomas Jefferson plays a fairly large role in the story of Old Chillicothe in, in terms of its end, because on January 1st, 1780, um, Mr. Jefferson and, at this point, Governor Jefferson, and uh, a young General, George Rogers Clark, begin to communicate, formally at least. And uh, in the first letter that they send to each other, um, Mr. Jefferson says, <clears throat> On the other hand, the Shawanese, Mingos, Muncies, and Nearer the Wyandots are troublesome thorns in our sides. However, we must leave it to yourself to decide on the object of your campaign. If against these Indians, the end proposed should be their extermination or their removal beyond the lakes or Illinois River. The same world will scarcely do for them and us. So the choice that he's offering, Mr. Clark, here is the option to take Detroit from the French or to remove the Shawnees and Wyandots and the tribes that are kind of standing in the way of uh, the promised lands of going back to um, those acres that had been promised to veterans of the French and Indian War, making good on that 
Western expansion, right? So that's the object that he's offering the choice to Mr. Clark to. Clark probably doesn't have a great chance of taking Detroit, so the only natural choice is to make a campaign against the Western tribes. Who are the Muncies? The Muncies are uh, Lenape, Delaware people. So, mm -hmm. And then th this actually s entirely starts from a uh, petition to George Rogers Clark, uh, March 10, 1780, um, where uh, they are essentially petitioning that Clark build up a militia to stop the Shawnee attacks on Kentucky settlements. Um, Jefferson is eager to hear a lot of this news in the Virginia capital, and he's offering support. Um, he has his own kind of goals in mind for these campaigns. And uh, so he says that we would have you cultivate peace and cordial friendship with several tribes of Indians, Shawnees accepted. Endeavor that those who are in friendship with us live in peace also with one another. Against those who are our enemies, let loose the friendly tribes. The Kickapoos should be encouraged against the hostile tribe of Chickasaws and Choctaws, and the others against the Shawnees. So this is January 29th that he is uh, sending this letter. Now, <clears throat> 1780 is kind of the pivotal year for what we're talking about. 1777 is roughly when we think that this was established. It was likely that there was already a small settlement here, either Miami or Shawnee, um, and, uh, and that this was sort of influxed by the Chillicothe town that was moving away from the side of the river here up to the Little Miami River. Uh, 1778, obviously Daniel Boone is captured. September of 1779, Simon Kenton is captured. Um, also in that same year, May of 1779, um, Benjamin Logan and John Bowman are unsuccessful at trying to take Old Chillicothe as well. But this, this is the, the year that it finally happens because on August 6, 1780, um, George Rogers Clark and about 1,200 men all together crossed and built cabins 16 foot square and a roof opposite mouth of the Licking and near the old stone mill. Um, and the walking up the Little Miami, nothing occurred until within five miles of Old Chillicothe, when the spies returned and gave information that the Indians appeared to be moving off from the town. The army now commenced to a run, kept a good smart trot, but when they reached the town about midday, they found the Indians had all gone and burnt their own town. Some pots were found over the fires, boiling green corn and snaps. The troops found a great relief and green roasting ears and string beans. So um, this is August 6, 1780. Um, this August 8th, 1780, um, from the same journal, he says, after, de after destroying the crops and buildings of Chillicothe, we began our march for the Pickaway settlements on the waters of the Big Miami, the Indians keeping runners continually before our advanced guards. At half past two in the evening of the 8th, we arrived in sight of the towns and forts, a plain and half mile long, uh, a plain of half mile in width lying between us. I had an opportunity of viewing the situation and motion of the enemy near their works. So he's talking about uh, the Pickaway Town, what is now George Rogers Clark County Park, right? So um, August 6th, he destroys Old Chillicothe, but nobody's there because they found him out. Some uh, accounts say that it was a dog that kind of alerted the town. Um, some accounts say that they ran into Indian spies um, that found them out, which is probably the more likely option. And on August 8th, um, he essentially chases the population of Old Chillicothe to where he thinks that they're heading, which he's likely correct, to the Pequoy town, which is about 12 miles uh, away, just south of Springfield. So, he's, and then he begins to sort of chase the population of this town up into northwestern Ohio. So that ends the history of Old Chillicothe, but not necessarily um, Chillicothe towns in general, because these places persist into Ohio and Illinois, Indiana, and even into Missouri and Kansas, Shawnee people are building Chillicothe's uh, all the way up until our final relocation into Oklahoma. So, but this is um, likely one of the last Chillicothe towns in Ohio um, of uniquely Shawnee make. So that's why this place is so special. And I will turn it over to Grant to talk about the design and kind of development of the site itself. Thank you. Thank you. Alan. I'll give him a break for a second. Uh, my name is Brant Folks, and my role with Parks and Watercraft is a capital program administrator, is what I'm called. But what that really means is I help out with uh, 
all of our building projects. Uh, my typical projects are a little bit more simple than this. We do a lot of restrooms and boat ramps and campground improvements. So hands down, this is the most exciting project I've ever got to work on. It's probably the most challenging I've ever got to work on as well, but it's been very much worth it. Um, so as Talon mentioned, I can talk briefly about the design of the building. Um, how many people have seen our building? I imagine almost everybody. It's in a pr pretty prominent location, which is great. Um, it's got a little bit of a unique uh, design to it, I'm sure you've noticed, and it is meant to mirror um, the look or the feel of a Shawnee Council House, which would have been a pretty large structure, not quite as large as what we're building, but a pretty large structure, and they really weren't living structures, they were more of a place for a meeting and gathering and ceremony and things like that. But the building that we're building, um, look at this image on the lower left. Let's see if I can figure out how we bump forward. So that image on the lower left in the last screen, you can kind of see the look and feel that we're going for here. So a council house would have been made out of logs and bark and natural materials like that. We want this to last for many, many decades. So of course we're building with modern building materials such as steel and aluminum and glass, but we're trying really hard to have that same look and feel. So we've got steel beams on the exterior of the building. Um, the siding of the building is going to be aluminum, but it's amazing how realistic it looks like actual wood siding. Um, the roof of the building is a plastic syn synthetic um, roofing material, but it looks spot on for cedar shake. So it's going to look very much like a natural building. It's about 12,000 square feet. We'll have three different floors. So we've actually got one floor below ground and then two floors above ground. Um, let me bump forward here. So I imagine most people here probably remember the Tecumseh Motel. This all got started when we purchased the Tecumseh Motel. Um, we bought that back in 2021 and we also bought an auto body shop that was right beside it. So we had about an acre and a half of ground and we started moving forward with the planning process and the design for the building and the construction of the building. You can see on the left there I've got an image from the demolition. On the top right, I've got an image from our groundbreaking ceremony. So that was um, back in June of 2022 when we broke ground. Um, so construction is moving forward pretty nicely now. Um, here in the bottom was an image that we took as the building was um, starting to come together and the steel frame was there and we could first start to get a feel for what it was going to come together like. And here's where we're at today on the construction. So we've got our roof on, we've got the glass in, we're still waiting on the final siding to be installed. Inside of the building, the floors are polished, drywall's going in, things are progressing pretty well. We've unfortunately been met with some of the same challenges that a lot of other construction sites are met with right now with COVID. It's amazing the odd things that you can't get still or that are very much a struggle to get. Um, the main electric panel for the building has been in order for almost two years now. It's just all kinds of weird things that just slow us down, but we're making good progress and of course hoping to be open sometime, um, hopefully this spring or early summer. I'm not going to get too much more in the uh, pinning down a date for that, but things are really progressing nicely on the building. Um, just to give you kind of a background, I said it's going to be about 12,000 square feet, so we'll have uh, approximately 4,000 square feet per floor. Um, when you first come into the building, you're going to be greeted by a front desk, and then you'll have the option of going left or right. To the right, we're going to have um, a small movie theater. So we do um, have a short introductory film plan. It's about 15 minutes. Hired a company to help us with that, so we've got pros working on that. To the left, we'll have a living stream exhibit, which I'll show you some renderings of here in a minute. Um, when you go downstairs, we plan a rotating art gallery, and uh, we've already got some neat thoughts on what the first art gallery is going to be. Um, we'll have that first one in place for about a year, and then we'll be thinking about what gallery we might put in the downstairs first, or second, I mean. And then the upstairs is where the heart of the exhibits are going to live, on the second floor, where we really get into the interpretation. A lot of the content that Talon just talked about is the story that we plan to tell on that second floor. Um, so like I mentioned, when you first come in, you'll have a nice front desk area. We're working with a company right out of Dayton called Exhibit Concepts to do the design and the um, exhibits for the first floor. So they're working closely with us on what the interpretation is going to look like and feel. 
Um, we've got some neat exhibits planned here. Here's a rendering on the right of an area where we're going to talk about the Little Miami River, its um, importance in history and to the village that would have been built there, and its importance still today to our society and economy. Um, you can see a little shape of a canoe, so we're going to talk a little bit about how um, the Shawnee and other American Indians at the time would have used the river for transportation. Um, some other exhibits for the first floor. We've got some interactive things for the kids. Um, so we'll talk about some of the art that Native Americans and the Shawnee would have done and have some interactives like cattail weaving and ribbon work. We've got some stuff to talk about trade. The fur trade was very prominent in the 1700s time period and it really impacted a lot of what was going on in the area and some of the, the wars that came about. So we're going to talk about the fur trade. Um, we'll have some neat exhibits. We're actually working with the Ohio History Connection to try to borrow some um, original items from that time period and we'll also have some replicas. Um, here you can see we've got a rendering of this tall case. We've actually got a couple of firearms from the 1700s that the History Connection is going to loan us to put in that glass case. We're going to have traps and pelts and a lot of the European goods that those furs would have been traded for in that exhibit. Like I said, we've got a small movie theater planned. Um, hoping to be able to fit a small classroom of kids. We're really gearing this building towards the idea that we'll be able to have classes of students come out to the site. So they'll have about a 15 minute introductory movie. It's a company called Argentine Productions out of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania that's helping us with the movie. And they do a lot of documentary and museum type movies. They're doing a project for the Natural, uh, National Park Service right now. So we've got a great team helping us with the movie. And here's that living stream I was talking about. This is one of the most exciting things, um, I think, in the building here. Has anybody here been to Battelle Darby's Metro Park um, Nature Center? We're a little bit removed from it here, but um, what we're doing is going to be very similar to theirs. It's basically a, a super big, fancy aquarium. It's going to hold about 1,000 gallons of water. It takes a few twists and turns, but it's going to be about 25 feet long. Um, it's going to have a deep pool of water and then a long riffle and then a shallow pool of water. And we're going to mirror this um, to kind of the nature of the Little Miami River that's right nearby our site. So we're going to have native fish species from that river, working with biologists from OSU and our um, sister agency, the Division of Wildlife, to make sure that we can get the appropriate species of fish for that exhibit. And we're working with a company called Bureau Group that actually built all of the aquariums for the Toledo Zoo to put this exhibit in for us. So I think it's going to be a beautiful exhibit when it's done. Um, the shallower tank, we're actually gearing it towards being able to have kids um, like a touch tank. They'll be able to get their hands wet, possibly pet a fish if the fish will let them. But I think the kids are going to enjoy playing around in that tank. Tim might not like it so much when uh, we got to clean up the floor afterwards, but I think that's going to be a lot of fun for everybody. Um, Talon is working with us on a really fun piece of interpretation for that exhibit as well. So we're going to have the fish in there and some fish ID and talk a little bit about the, um, the natural resources of the river. But he also came up with this really fun idea where we're going to have some rel replica stone points and hide those in the river as well and have a little bit of a discussion. So as you find those stone points in the river, almost like a timeline showing how those stone points changed and evolved through the centuries. So just one more thing to kind of build interest in that exhibit. Okay, let um, me bump it over to you for level two. Sure. Okay, so the, like I mentioned before, the second exhibit of this building is where we're going to really get into the uh, main interpretation for the site and talking about the history. So Talon's our expert on that, and I'll let him fill you in there. All right. Well, I know I blew through the first part pretty quick. I could have probably spent all day on that. But uh, this is where the story of Old Town is really going to come to life. Uh, on the second floor here. So as you come off the elevator, come up the stairs, um, you're going to see a small uh, welcome kiosk and some large graphics and banners kind of telling you thematically where you're at in the story. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of different, uh, different points here, but let's start here. Does this work? Yes, it does. So the, uh, ah, you can't see it on there. Uh, the main stairway that leads you right from the front doors, you're going to come up here or come up one of the elevators, 
that entry kiosk uh, number one, the green one, uh, gives you a good uh, idea of what the story is going to be about. Uh, Old Town as a site, um, as a prehistoric site, as a historic site, and then also today, um, kind of the development of, of uh, Great Council as well. Uh, a small model of what the village might have looked like. Um, and then uh, as you kind of progress through, as you come to the next part of the graphics, this is the early years. This is about hmm, 15,000 years of history in about three panels. Um, <laughs> so obviously we have a long human history here in Ohio. There's no way that we could fit it all um, into the space that we have available. Um, every part of this story is just so rich that there's no possible way that we could fit all of it. But the purpose of this is to show sort of a, a human and cultural continuity from even the earliest people in Ohio, 13 or 15,000 years ago, through this development of culture and religion and identity and technology to the historic tribes like Shawnee and Miami and Delaware um, that are living here uh, at European arrival. So you're going to learn a little bit about um, Hopewell trade. You're going to learn about um, the mound building practices of cultures like Adena and Hopewell. Um, you're going to see examples of their artworks, the raw materials that were being brought in from places more than 2,000 miles away, um, and kind of the spiritual underpinnings of people like Shawnee. The next part uh, that's highlighted now, uh, if you didn't see that highlight, there it is. Uh, that is a 17 foot by 9 foot uh, reconstruction of a bark house. In Shawnee, we call it Wequo. Um, and uh, it's dressed uh, kind of seasonally. So this uh, is going to highlight sort of the beginning of colonization to about the mid 18th century. Uh, we're going to highlight a lot of what happens in the 17th century with the Beaver Wars um, and the kind of conflict around the Ohio Valley between different tribal nations. Um, focusing on home life and what this is doing to people living at home. Each of those kind of blue boxes you can see in there is um, a display about what life was like for Shawnee people at home. Um, there's a kind of a line of four boxes right on one side and that those are actually um, trade trunks, um, small wooden trunks, and as you open those up and look you'll find um, the Shawnee word for different seasons. Um, so like we open it up and here's Milokami, the spring, and you'd learn what Shawnee families were doing in the springtime. You'd be able to pick up uh, a sugar tapping spile made of sumac. You'd be able to pick up fish hooks and things like that, where uh, these are the things that people are doing in those time periods. And kind of as the seasons change, the dressing of that house will change as well. And then the majority of this floor, um, the whole back wall, uh, kind of wrapping around as well, talks about Old Town or Old Chillicothe uh, in its historic period, from 1777 to 1780. So you'll see exhibits about uh, kind of general Shawnee history and culture, like uh, dispelling stereotypes about clothing and lifestyles. You know, obviously, nobody uh, in the Ohio country lived in teepees. Um, you know, dispelling the myth of like material culture and headdresses and religion and all of those types of things, and kind of getting uh, to one clear picture. And then talking about the historic figures like um, uh, Tecumseh, Daniel Boone, Simon Kenton, the people that people are familiar with, the names that people are familiar with, but putting them in the right context in the interpretation for this particular site. For example, um, Tecumseh is one of the ones that is going to be mentioned quite a bit, but we have no historic record that he really ever set foot on the site and was let alone born there. Um, <laughs> And so we're going to be interpreting these historical figures um, in pairs. So Tecumseh and his sister. Um, we're going to be interpreting people like Simon Kenton and Caesar. Um, Daniel Boone and Chief Blackfish. Every character has a pair. And every pair is a person that is well known and a person that is not as well known, who probably should be, uh, that has a relationship to the other person. So as you're going through, you're going to learn about that three-year period. Um, learn what the trade life was like uh, for people who were living in Old Town. Learn about what uh, people were doing on the day-to-day. -day. Um, just kind of what life was like in the mid to late 18th century for the people that were living here. And then the timeline from 77 to 1780 uh, that we can document for the kind of 
um, relocation of this village until it was relocated again. As you wrap around the wall, coming up to this sort of large circular area here, um, you're going to be learning about sort of the removal history of Shawnee people from Ohio, um, starting in the latter part of the 18th century and continuing on into the mid 19th century um, <clears throat> through uh, like 1832 when our Lewistown band of Shawnees is beginning to be removed from our reservation down to Oklahoma. Uh, you're going to learn about some of the uh, uh, relocation process, where we actually end up in Oklahoma, and then that large kind of circular um, circular thing at the end is actually a, a pretty big uh, visual piece that talks about our life today in Oklahoma, where the Shawnee people are now, uh, some statements from our tribal leaders, pictures of our tribal citizens, kind of learning about um, what we're doing contemporarily. So, and then there's a good example of one of those character panels, uh, what those are going to look like. We have resources scattered kind of throughout the floor uh, in the form of uh, books. There's a large bookshelf in the middle where you can kind of sit on benches, pull out a book, read uh, information that's relevant to the content. You might be able to scan QR codes, um, stickers on some of the exhibits to get information that you can take with you and read later. Um, and then we may even have some print pamphlets of information that you can physically pick up and take with you to read uh, on your own pace as well. So here's what that intro uh, kiosk is going to look like, in a sense. So you can see uh, an illustration of the village that's being commissioned right now. Uh, the History Connection's working on getting that. Plus some 3D printed models of some of the village structures, like the Longhouse, uh, the Weequa, uh, Indian cabins, uh, bark cabins, completely European-made houses that are being commissioned, uh, that we know are being done uh, at that time. And then a large map here mm -hmm. of Greene County, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that map. Um, so it kind of just gives a sense of place. Here are two of the large kind of graphic panels for the early years section. So you can see here the orange panel, uh, which talks about kind of the background and the cultural uh, timeline of uh, Ohio. So you can see from earliest human evidence all the way through that red line. Uh, if you don't know if you, it's so tiny, I don't even know if you can see it, but it just gives you a span of how massive uh, the scale of human history is here. And then the trade map, which shows where some of these exotic materials like silver and copper and obsidian and grizzly bear teeth, marine shells, are all coming here to Ohio uh, as kind of the cultural center of the world for the people that are living in North America uh, about 2,000 years ago. We have some really cool graphics here in the, uh, the week wall itself including um, some panels. The History Connection is going to be printing directly onto Stretch Deer Hide um, that will be hung up inside that. We have some historical images of these houses, and then uh, that's kind of what it will look like if you were to stand inside. So it's kind of partially deconstructed because we've got a large window on one side, and we want to allow as much natural light in as possible. So you'll see the frame, the bent frame, along with the bark covering on one side to give you an idea of what that building would look like. And then lots of natural light coming in behind you. Uh, lots of historical reproductions that are going to be available to dress out that and make it look alive and also to handle. So um, we have tribal artists working on things like Doug Pukonki of the Miami Nation working on uh, stickball sticks for people to handle. We've got reproduction food that won't go bad. We've got uh, reproduction glass bottles from makers in England who have been making the same bottles for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, blanket coats. Um, we've got reproduction bows and fishing equipment and maple sugaring stuff. Lots and lots of uh, home life uh, tools and goods. There's uh, kind of that little corner exhibit I was telling you about. Uh, with a historical image of a Shawnee person and um, a not-so-historical <laughs> image of Native people, uh, kind of comparing, you know, what are we familiar with, uh, what sort of stereotypes have infiltrated our view of uh, Native people as a whole, and then kind of focusing in on Shawnee, talking about gender roles, um, you know, racial relationships, uh, and some of the misconceptions that are kind of built up around those ideas. 
Um, one of the things that's really exciting to me is some of the artwork that we have in the building because if you can see on the lower artwork there, that's a, uh, a painting called It's a Good Day to Trade by Robert Griffin. Has anyone seen any of Robert Griffin's art before? He's an 18th century painter, um, well, he's a 21st century painter that paints 18th century scenes. Um, and uh, he has lots and lots of beautiful artwork, as does uh, Mr. Doug Hall, the other artist that is featured prominently in the building. Um, really visually stunning stuff and very good representations of kind of this active living world of the 18th century. So excited to have some of that in there, as, as well as some original documents like uh, the Fort Pitt's uh, waste book um, from uh, the late 1760s, talking about what's going out into the Ohio country. Places like Fort Pitt, Fort Detroit, I was just sending out a lot of uh, trade goods to the Ohio Valley. So if you were standing <clears throat> kind of in the corner by the Wequa, looking down the hallway, this is what your view might look like of that section there. So large banners that say things like trade and land, um, you know, and uh, relationships and so on and so forth, kind of tell you where you're at in the story. There's going to be a large village illustration in the middle of that sort of corridor, uh, and then at the bottom of it, a timeline of Old Town from 1777 to 1780, um, and then kind of some points about daily life in Old Town during the seasons, as well as historical quotes from people like the Reverend David Jones about what uh, Shawnee people are doing during the time. On the back side of that panel, there is a large interactive um, <clears throat> this is kind of focused on one part of Shawnee history, and uh, you can see in this graphic here where this young man is standing, this is a large kind of bead wall, <clears throat> and those beads are two colors, one white and one purple on one side and the other, and as you turn them you can kind of reveal those colors, making patterns very similar to our wampum belts, our historical wampum belts that are used to create treaties and laws and kind of long-standing documents. Um, we're going to have examples of historical wampum belts um, so that you can get an idea of how people use this uh, symbolism to represent um, ideas and concepts. <clears throat> As we're talking about kind of the end of Old Town, a lot of the content that I shared with you in the first part of our presentation here um, is going to be there as well. Uh, along with a much more expanded view of the context of what's going on in 1780. Uh, this is kind of its own independent story, not necessarily part of the American Revolution, but something that's happening congruently right around the same time. So, And then, as we're talking about that latter section, getting out of Ohio, being removed uh, in the mid-19th century, will show kind of where Shawnee people are condensing into there's three reservations in Ohio that we end up, uh, Wapakoneta, Hog Creek, and Lewistown. And then from there, kind of following that three-way split as it carries on into the three federally recognized Shawnee tribes today. And then there's that last section. You can see it kind of takes up a lot of space there at the end uh, that talks about the three federally recognized Shawnee tribes, messages from our tribal leadership, pictures of tribal citizens, quotes from cultural preservation staff today about um, what's going on, some vital statistics like population, um, you know, annual national income, so you can get an idea of um, you know, the sense that Shawnee people are still around, still living, still uh, evolving. And I think this uh, next section, if anybody wants to jump in on this, feel free, but <clears throat> this is kind of a perfect representation of that content as well. So. Now that we've covered the second floor, the basement gallery uh, is going to be a sort of community gallery, a rotating exhibit space. Um, most, in the museum world, most traveling exhibits, if they contain artifacts or any sensitive materials, require at least nine months of environmental data for a building uh, in order for you to request uh, those to come there. They also cost a lot of money. So we don't have nine months of working environmental data for our building, uh, so it's very hard to request a traveling exhibit to come and be hosted at our site. So uh, to start off with, uh, we are going to be hosting this. This is a photo gallery of uh, our tribal citizens in Northeast Oklahoma, quotes from our tribal citizens, 
all centered around the theme of what does it mean to be me. So it's going to explore three different layers of identity. It's going to explore um, sort of the identity, the perceived identity of being Native American, the tribal identity, and how we perceive ourselves nationally, and then the individual identity, looking at how the person themselves wants to be seen and heard and understood outside of how other people might see them, right? And that's kind of the space uh, there in the lower level. That whole main gallery uh, will be taken up largely by that exhibit. Um, we're still developing a, a small that overflow side gallery there. There's going to be something in there uh, that's interactive that people can do, um, maybe for kids. But uh, this gives you a good idea of kind of the imagery and uh, the, the look and feel, I guess you might say, of what this lower level might look like. Showing an active community, um, showing the environment of Northeast Oklahoma where we live today. So I think I can turn this over to Tim, yeah. talk a little bit more about the future of the park. Thank you, Talon. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's a real honor to uh, introduce myself and talk a little bit more about um, the rest of what's going on at Grid Council as a site and, and a park. So indeed, uh, we do have more to do, and that's kind of where my position comes into play. I'm the new park manager for Grid Council in John Bryan State Park. Uh, and just started about two and a half months ago. So I, I've been telling people I'm still in absorption mode. I'm learning a tremendous amount from Talon. We share an office right now. Um, about the history of the Shawnee people and about the Shawnee culture today. Um, learning a lot from Brandt, who's been intimately involved with this project and is just a, an absolute maverick and wealth of knowledge. So uh, definitely an honor to uh, get to present a little bit more uh, with them today. So indeed, um, we we're creating a park in addition to this, this amazing museum that's going to be at this site. And uh, it'll be relatively small compared to other state parks, but still a very beautiful space with a lot of opportunity for a little bit of recreation, uh, communion with nature, and learning about um, native ecology. And it will feel a lot bigger than the, the 15 plus acres that it sits on because of the, the surrounding um, land that is um, owned by a farm that's part of uh, Tecumseh Land Trust and an agreement that we have with Little Miami Conservancy. Uh, so even on those 15 acres, it feels much more expansive. And uh, what we're going to be doing with those um, with that land is, is really exciting. So just to talk about some of the, the logistics here, previously John Bryan State Park was essentially managed by the staff at Buck Creek State Park, just outside of Springfield up there, and kind of a, a satellite location for that staffing team. Um, one opportunity with the, the creation of Great Council Park is to combine management of John Bryan and Great Council into kind of a, a little Miami Valley management team here. <laughs> Uh, so, myself and the staff that um, we're hiring uh, will, will oversee both facilities and manage both parks, and we're right down the street. So, it's really exciting for me. Um, I, I come from parks industry, and prior to uh, taking this position, worked with Five Rivers Metro Parks, one county over for about 13 years, and served as sustainability manager for the past six. Uh, so, you know, I, I grew up in this area. I've been hiking John Bryan since I was a kid, and I'm incredibly uh, excited about uh, this new project and this, this learning opportunity for me, and to be able to help facilitate such a wonderful and important project. So just real quickly, I'm not going to go through all of these, but that gives you an idea of what ODR and ODNR is investing in Great Council and this, this management zone. So in black, uh, those are the uh, positions that we already have on site. And the red positions there are ones that we're actively working on hiring right now. So if you know anyone that wants a job, you know, come and check out our, our, our uh, careers.ohio.gov. Get with me. Um, but we will have a full-time naturalist soon working under uh, Talon. And it really opens up a, a great opportunity not just to do programming for Great Council, but also to activate John Bryan State Park a little bit more as well. So I'm sure many of you are aware there's an incredible wealth of natural resources and, and ancient history down there that, that's uh, very worthwhile. And that park, while I think it's beloved by many people, has been you know, a, a little bit of hands-off management over the years. So uh, having that opportunity to activate the space a little bit more is really exciting to me. 
We promise we won't overactivate it. I know some people have mentioned that, like, oh, it's so nice because it's quiet out there. <laughs> so, you know, we're just talking about utilizing, we have some beautiful triple C shelters and a day lodge and this incredible gorge to go hiking in and having staff on site that can give people guided experiences down there. Retail, so we're going to sell stuff. Uh, we're, we're just starting to, to get some of this merchandise in, and it's been really exciting. Um, some excellent swag, so to speak. Oh, we got this, this uh, oh, that, the red dot doesn't show up on the screen, sorry. But uh, thermoses over there that are branded, tote bags, um, both have this wonderful insignia that, that Talon designed. And this is a prototype, it's not an actual uh, piece yet, but, but Sakona, the the yeah, interpretive dog will have stuffed replicas of, of him to, to sell in the museum. It's the cutest thing we've seen so far. <laughs> um, to talk a little bit about the, the geography, I know everyone's driven past, you know roughly where Great Council will be, but just to talk about the layout of that land and um, what we're going to be planning on the grounds uh, surrounding that area. Again, I can't use the, uh, I'll, I'll come over here and point. You know, where it says ODNR and has a little blue bubble, that's exactly where the museum will be. But the, the property that ODNR owns basically is all of this green area around these farmhouses and structures that currently sit there. And then over into this sort of tan area, which is, you can't tell from this uh, satellite image, but is down the hill and into the floodplain. Um, and to look at that on, on a map, I can show you a little bit about what's planned there. That whole area on the grounds of the museum, or the majority of it anyway, was planted in native uh, grasses and forbs to be a future prairie by uh, a contractor who's done a lot of great work around here named Terry Levy and his team, and already has a trail cut through it that's about uh, just a half mile. You know, so it's, it's not a long trail, but enough that people can go out, meander through the prairie, think about the uh, history lesson they've just had, and kind of uh, meditate on, upon what this land was at one point in time in history. We also have access to the Little Miami River, which you can see just up in the corner of this image, and a trail that will go through the Little Miami Conservancy property. We uh, just completed an MOU for access there, which we call the Tecumseh Preserve Trail. The uh, Prairie Loop is uh, officially titled the Blackfish Trail after Chief Blackfish. So, all in all, there's still a little bit of a recreational experience there. We'll have a nice little vista kind of down at the river in the riparian zone. And you can kind of imagine, as you're wandering those lands, what sort of agricultural activity took place there. And since we have lessons about the, uh, the Shawnee connection to the riverways, really think about that as you explore the river corridor there. So a few recent pictures, you know, it's, it's winter time. <laughs> But there are nice pastoral views out there. Uh, this is standing kind of on, just on the upland area that overlooks the floodplain and eventually the, the uh, Little Miami Conservancy property. So we're right behind the facility here. This is where the, the uh, upland area kind of turns to floodplain. And then right back there where there's taller vegetation is where Little Miami Conservancy property starts. So a few pictures here. It was cold enough, we were able to get some equipment out there, and our uh, in-house Southwest construction team brought out some stone benches the other day. You know, we're going to make this a really comfortable place to, to sit and uh, observe, think about the history lessons, and we do a little birding. It's going to be wonderful to have this hat out there as well. <laughs> Cleaning up the grounds, my crew's been out there you know, <laughs> trimming trees, removing honeysuckle, uh, just trying to make this a, a nice spot. So when, we're open up, when we open up, we'll have uh, picnic tables and grounds that people can really enjoy. Uh, folks that are coming through on the bikeway can stop by and maybe take a picnic lunch over there. It's going to be a really nice space. So finally, I just kind of want to think about like Great Council as a, a, a shining and most illustrious piece of, of an experience that people can have in this region. You know, uh, Yellow Springs is already a destination for day tripping and, and uh, weekending, um, and it's just growing. You know, Green County as a whole has a lot of development. There's a lot of interest in, in uh, Yellow Springs as a destination uh, that continues to grow. And a deep, uh, deep uh, experience for both natural resource and cultural uh, history here. 
You know, I, I picked these two photos just because down in that gorge we get a slice of ancient history. We can see mm -hmm. these white cedar trees that are, are thousands of years old in some, certain cases, and species that don't typically exist in this area because of this little slice of pre-glaciated Ohio. So there's a really deep natural history lesson to be had here. Um, of course, at John Bryan Park we have more recent history with the triple C structures that kind of define our park. And then we're so proximal to lots of other sites that I think people will be interested in, and certainly are. You know, th this region, we have a connection with the, the Fort Ancient Museum. Serpent Mound is not far. And so we're really just thinking about how we promote Great Council ongoing as, as part of a, a broader historical experience in this region. So I'm very excited about it. I know you all are too. And at this point, uh, we'd like to kind of transition into Q&A. Yeah, I'll let Brian talk. Sorry. I was just thinking about something that we didn't really mention at the beginning and that we should have, is the partnerships that we've done on this project. So there's been so many groups that have helped us pull this off. Um, first off, we have worked with all three federally recognized tribes of Shawnee. So the Eastern Shawnee, which Talon is a member of, the Shawnee tribe, and then the Absentee Shawnee tribe. So we have worked with them and consulted with them from the beginning of the project to make sure that we tell the story accurately and respectfully. Um, we've also been working with the Ohio History Connection. So Talon um, kind of gave an overview of level two. Um, the Ohio History Connection has been a really important partner with us as we develop that second floor where we really get in to the history of the site. So working with them to do um, to help us tell the story and help us design the exhibits. Um, a few other partners, the Greene County Historical Society and the Yellow Springs Historical Society, we've been trying to pull them into the loop. Um, been meeting with the Greene County Historical Society lately as we plan one of our more, um, we plan an exhibit that kind of talks about what happened to this area after the Indian Removal Act. So they've been helping us gather images of the Galloway cabin and some of those historical images and facts about the Galloway family and some of the other early settlers in the area. So we're pulling all of those kind of things together. We're going to have an exhibit on the first floor where we actually have a reenactment of a pioneer frontiersman camp. And on the second floor, we're going to have an exhibit that talks about the Galloway family and some of the other important families that moved into that area afterwards. And then that makes me think about one other item we failed to talk about. Does, a lot of people probably remember the hotel, of course, that was there. But in front of that, there was for decades um, numerous stone monuments that helped kind of remind people of the importance of the site. So because of the building process, we of course had to take those down and protect them. They mostly lived at John Bryan State Park, wrapped up in crates and protected, but we're starting to bring those back as well. So um, each side of the building will have two of those monuments for a total of six. So south, west, and north side of the building. And we're also gonna have a little bit of a um, bronze plaque that kind of talks about what that, who put that monument up and why, and. Some of them have some facts that might be a little bit um, disputed now, so talk about that. Um, so try to do uh, a good job of honoring the history of that site and the things that have happened since the time of Old Town. So I'll wrap up and okay. go ahead and do questions. Take questions. I imagine we'll have a few questions. Go ahead. What does the word Chillicothe mean? I'm going to let Talon handle that one. <laughs> So the word Chillicothe, um, so there's lots of these place names that come from uh, particular stories that we have. So, um, for example, um, Piqui, Piqui means like ashes or dust. Um, Piquilani is the place itself, so the place is ashes or dust. Guapacunita um, means like a place that everyone sees or a place that everyone looks at. Chillicothe means um, particularly like, it's like a hardwood tree, like a white oak. Um, this is a, a center kind of post. Um, and so that's what that word talks about, is that this is a central post made of a hard glue, like white oak. Um, so, yeah. So there's a couple of those like historical names that we kind of carry from place to place. Um, Chillicothe is, is one of those. That's what that word means. Go ahead. What was the uh, population at its peak there? So what was the population of Old Chillicothe? Our Old Chillicothe at its peak? Speak. Not entirely sure. Um, the estimate that I have seen, um, I keep looking for more historical documents that talk about this site and what it was like alive. Um, 
over a thousand is what I have seen uh, in, in the one reference that I've been able to find to the population of Old Chillicothe. Um, between a thousand and twelve hundred is kind of the estimate that, that I've seen. So uh, I'd love to see if that's corroborated by future archaeology of the site. So there's somebody in the back there. Yeah. I'm curious as to where we have parking. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, if you look close when you drive by, you can see the parking as it is now. So I mentioned earlier, we had initially just purchased two properties for a little over an acre, and we went ahead and started with this. We had talked to a lot of other landowners at the time, and really wasn't a lot of interest in selling. So we have parking right now for about 18 vehicles, plus a, a loop for buses to turn around. Since that time, though, I think you know, we've, we've done a good job of talking with the community and communicating more and more about what we're doing. And we've been able to uh, procure three more properties north of our site. So one after another after another, which has helped us expand in that direction. And then we actually also, um, as Tim mentioned, we're going to have some hiking behind it. We were able to um, separate and purchase 14 acres of the farmland behind the site. So it's grown a little bit, and we're definitely hoping that we can expand the parking some because we know it's tight, but it is right to the north of the building. And it, it's paved now, so you can see it when you go by. Well, the, the, the gravel lot, too. Yes, so yep. So for when we first open up, um, so right now we've taken down those three houses, and we've currently got a construction trailer and the construction guys are kind of parking there in that area. So I think our initial thoughts are like once they get that construction trailer out, we'll gravel the rest of that in, clean it up, and we can have some additional parking there for the time being until we get it kind of permanent. And yeah, probably about 50, I think, total that we could get in there. Um, will there be ceremony when this building opens, indigenous ceremony? And will it be public? So, will there be ceremony, tribal ceremonies happening at Great Council when it opens up? That's really going to be, I think, up to the direction of our tribal partners. So, the three Shawnee tribes that we're working with, um, I would say that is kind of up to, you know, I mean, this is a Shawnee site. Um, we're talking about Shawnee history, where Shawnee people live. Um, I think that's something that, you know, anything that happens there related to contemporary culture or identity for Shawnee people is going to have to be a partnership between what we're doing and also too with our tribal partners. So our main focus is going to be on interpreting the history of Old Chillicothe when it was alive in the 1770s and 80s. Um, and then the story of how that site has developed up to the present day. When we're talking about anything related to modern tribal identity or culture or religions, that's all coming straight from our tribal nations to make sure that it's the best that it can be. So anything that happens on the site uh, when it comes to our contemporary tribal identity is going to involve our tribal partners. Right. So We'll make sure there's a big event for the grand opening of that everyone's event. Yeah, no, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, what do you have planned for kids? Kids draw people to historical places. And the other question I had was, when are you planning to open? <laughs> the second part of that is a good question. We'll find an update soon. But uh, as far as the exhibit goes, what do you see as the main draw for Kids Town? I'd say there's a lot. I mean, the building itself, inside of our uh, almost 13,000, 12, 12 to 13,000 square feet. We have about 7,500 square feet of exhibit space. There's hands-on activities kind of built into lots of the exhibits themselves. I mean, obviously we have the living stream, we have arts interactives, we have flip panels, we have the dog character that pops up and kind of gives a, um, a uh, kind of below, like fifth grade level uh, highlights of each of the different interpretive content in the, in the site, as well as outside on the trails. Um, you know, we're gonna have takeaway information, um, probably develop things like um, teacher information and coloring sheets and activities that can be uh, disseminated as well. Um, my wife's a, a fourth grade social studies teacher in Springfield, so she's been bugging me the whole time to make sure that there's kids stuff involved. Um, and then, of course, the interpretations that are going to happen there at Great Council, too. So not only just the static exhibits that you can kind of take a self-guided tour through, but we're going to have a full-time naturalist 
as as well as myself and you know probably one or two other people uh, eventually interpreting there. And so I mean we're talking about. I mean, I've been writing programs uh, on traditional hunting practices and looking at, you know, uh, our traditional tools, our traditional metalworking, textiles, lots and lots of hands-on things. The fur trade uh, of the 18th century is a huge source for interactive programming. Um, you know, I mean, we can do a lot with the content that we have there at the site. So talking about history and culture and identity, material culture, uh, and then even comparing between modern and what we have today and uh, what existed in, in the historic period as well. So not only are the exhibits themselves kind of designed to be interactive, but we've got a lot of interactive programming planned for the site uh, as well. So. Um, I have two questions also. Uh, will you be having a volunteer program there? Uh, volunteer docents maybe? Um, or even just stepping in the shop or whatever? And um, the second question is, will you be coordinating at all with Sunwatch in Maiden? Uh, I know that goes way back, <laughs> but historically it would be just coming. Those are good questions. And uh, we will have tour guides who are on staff um, to help you know, give basic guidance around the museum and, and, and lead groups. I'm certain that we will have a volunteer program as well. It's not defined yet, but I know that will be a desirable thing. And, and to be able to uh, attract the kind of audiences that we want, we'll certainly need extra help. So yes. Uh, the second piece of that, again, Talon, any, any comments about partnering with Sunwatch potentially? Um, yeah, I mean, so on the topic of Sunwatch, um, when we were kind of in the earlier stages of developing Great Council, one of the things that um, our director requested that we do was make trips out to interpretive sites that were doing similar things, that had kind of um, mechanisms already in place that we could look at as examples. So we made trips to national park sites, we made trips to other state parks, we made trips to places like Sunwatch. Um, and so we've kind of looked at the examples of how they're interpreting content, what their tribal partnerships look like, what their retail spaces look like, and how they're managed. Uh, most recently, I think we went to Fort Ancient, um, as far as partnerships with Sunwatch, um, I mean, I, I know the people there very well. Um, people like Jill Grieg and the folks who work for the Boonshoft who run that site. Um, it's always good to kind of look at how their partnerships are developing, especially as they're looking to redo a lot of what's in their interpretive center. Um, they're kind of moving that direction and kind of reworking their tribal partnerships. Um, Bill Kennedy was the, the site manager there for a long time and built a lot of the structures uh, at Sunwatch. Um, so, I mean, personally, I have a good relationship with all of the museum staff that work there. Um, they're excited to revamp their space, um, and I think they're actually kind of looking at Great Council as an example yeah. now. Um, <laughs> but uh, officially, I have, I have no idea what the partnerships, if any, will look like with other museum sites, but I'm excited. Um, because as future archaeology uh, at Great Council uh, kind of comes about, our partner has been Ball State University for the most part, Dr. Kevin Nolan and Dr. Christine Thompson, who have done a lot of historic sites, uh, Shawnee and Miami sites in Western Ohio, um, and uh, the archaeologists at the National Park Service, like Dr. Brett Ruby and Dr. Tim Everard, um, Bill Kennedy, and some of the other, Sarah Hinkleman. Um, I mean, these great people who have lots of working knowledge on historical and ancient American Indian sites, um, some of which are now UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, so it's going to be interesting for me, personally, to get their input on the future development of archaeology and collections that come out of that archaeology, um, because they've been doing it for decades now. So. Go ahead. I assume you did a phase one environmental on the property. And I'm curious whether or not any of the findings are in, going to be included in the museum. Yes, yeah, so we worked with a company called Lahan to do all of the historical background research. Um, and in fact, they actually had staff that were on site. Oh, thank, thank you. you. They actually had staff on site anytime we were digging and observing the entire time because we knew um, the history of the site and how important it would be to be very careful. Um, the sites that we have demolished and where we have dug obviously were very heavily modified already. So they really haven't found anything yet. Um, but it's something that we've been very concerned about and very cautious about. Um, we're definitely hoping in the future that we can do some archaeological research on the, on the property as a whole. Um, I know that 
many years ago, there was some research done um, on the land that we acquired, the extra 14 acres. They did a, a grid survey there, but there's a lot of new technologies since then, um, things that might be able to help us possibly without even having to turn any dirt, um, find some more history of the site. So excited about what the future might hold there. Go ahead. Yes, I'm curious to know, if amongst the swag, will there be um, current Native American artists' works exhibited? Um, yeah, we're working right now to find some partnerships. I think, Melissa, fill me in a little bit, but I think we've identified some jewelry and some items like that. Yeah, we have we have two uh, Native artists that we're working with to, to secure some, some jewelry, um, ornaments, some other um, goods that would be handmade. Yeah. So thank you. And both are Shawnee women. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir? I wonder why you haven't mentioned the original law house. As far as the council house that was there? Yeah. Well. It's location, where you think it is. Mm hmm might let you weigh in on that. I don't think we officially know exactly where it was. So the original location of the council house, um, we don't know for certain where that is. There were some historical um, sort of, I would say after the time of Old Chillicothe, after, well after it had been burnt, um, some speculation on where the council house might have stood. But without any actual hard science to go with that, and it's impossible to say where that is. That would need um, actual ground survey, actual geo survey to uncover the archaeology of that site. Uh, magnetometry would be a great first step uh, in that direction um, to establishing where any of the village structures were. Um, but as far as where the original council house stood, that stood uh, until 1780, uh, it's very hard to say where that is without any actual uh, scientific evidence. So, he like said there are a couple of historic accounts that claim that the remnants of the council house stood up until relatively recently, um, but they're clearly not there today. Um, and so, without actually going out and doing a survey of the site, uh, it'd be very hard to know where that is. One uh, survey in 1975 that put it on the National Register of Historic Places dated it to the correct period uh, the, of the latter part of the 18th century. And then um, the Reardon survey in 1980 from Wright State um, found other materials that dated it to the correct period, but I think they only found a grand total of three post holes of the entirety of the site that they surveyed. Um, so very sparse archaeological data to go with the site, but that's hopefully something that the future will kind of come up with. And you're sure it's in the 14 acres? No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's science. <laughs> I might have missed this, but was Tecumseh um, of, of the Shawnee tribe? Yes. He was, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will the flight path formally connect with the, <coughs> with the site? That's I a, know it runs parallel, yeah. but you got to cross over 68, right? That's a really good question. Um, so the bike path is very close by, and we know people are going to want to come. We know people are going to want to come from the bike path to the building. Um, right now, ODOT uh, has been a really good partner with us, and they have worked with us to put in, um, they're installing it now, so some extra stuff to signal the pedestrians that might be coming from the bike trail up Brush Row Road and crossing to our building. But we very much want in the future to have a much safer connection. So we have actually purchased a parcel across the road that would connect to the bike trail. And we're working with our partners at ODOT right now um, to figure out what the best plan would be for a safe connection. So I, I think there's more to come on that. Yes, sir? I'm wondering what you can tell us about traditional tribal leadership succession. Sure, so the question was about traditional tribal leadership. Uh, I'm going to speak specifically for Shawnees in this case. Um, like most other tribes, historically, uh, we are some form of a democracy or democratic republic. Um, so historically, I would refer to Shawnee people in the mid to late 18th century as a poly republic. We have no centralized government, but we all follow the same rules. Each individual township is governed kind of independently from the rest. Um, we also are part of what I call the big three, um, agricultural, democratic, and matrilineal matriarchal. 
Um, so we are a largely women-led society as well. So most of the real political power of our community uh, lies in the hands of women. So we have nine clans. Each of those clans have um, sort of these head women uh, that consider the matriarchs of those matrilineal clans. Um, they form one kind of mind. Um, and so our traditional government is meant to represent the way that we think the mind of our creator works. So our creator, we call uh, which means the grandmother of all living things. So our deity is a female kind of persona, and she has um, her mind, and the left and the right hand. Um, and so when, in our community, the way that that's reflected is that we have this female mind, this council of nine women who represent the community and the families, and they make one decision and then deliver that to one of two people, the left or the right hand of the community. These are messengers who have no real power of their own who go out and do things on behalf of the community in one realm or another. The left hand handles matters of war, the right hand handles matters of peace. These two men are often confused as being the leaders of the community, but they are really the messengers of the community. Um, so people like Chief Blackfish or Chief Cornstalk, for example, people who advocate for peace, or people who fight uh, conflicts and make treaties related to war. Two completely different roles that are being given to them by the women leadership within our traditional community. So that's actually the case for a lot of tribal communities like Six Nations uh, who have a sort of internalized female government that's represented by an external uh, male representative mainly because our bloodlines are passed down from woman uh, to woman, from mother to daughter. So if that woman who makes decisions is to lose her life traveling or being out, getting ill, it completely disrupts our communal structure. Um, and so it's much safer socially to, to give those roles to men. Um, and that's why we're consistently represented externally by men, even though our, our real government, I guess you could say, is run mostly by uh, women within the community. So. It's the way they would like it to be now. Alan, <laughs> 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 would you tell us uh, how you uh, came to speak your native tongue fluently and maintain fluency? That's a great question. Um, I'm flattered. So uh, the question was about the Shawnee language, how I came to be fluent. Uh, I'm not fluent. Um, I, I grew up uh, participating in the Eastern Shawnee language classes. I uh, am very grateful to have learned from a fluent speaker. Um, so all of the Shawnee language I know came from Mr. George Blanchard. Um, I spent several years uh, with him in the language department for the Eastern Shawnee tribe. And um, you know his goal was while we were in the office that we wouldn't speak English uh, or as little as possible. And um, so I'm not fluent. Although I was a language teacher, I was teaching people who would never know if I was fluent or not fluent. Uh, and so uh, I got my letters and numbers and colors down pat. But um, I would consider myself conversational at best. I can hold a conversation with other language learners like myself, but I still need help from fluent speakers. I still am learning very much so. So we have about 150 fluent speakers of the Shawnee language alive today. Uh, but I will say we have an excellent language program. We have language apps. Uh, we have worksheets, and lots of curriculum. Um, and so I think very soon we're going to start building a new generation of fluent speakers. Um, I'd love to see something like the Eastern Band Cherokee. They have the Gadua Language Academy where they receive their K-12 education in Cherokee and then learn English as a foreign language in high school. Um, so. um, what made you decide to build this museum? That's a great question. What made us decide to build this? Who wants to take that one first? <laughs> well, um, I was in here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to weigh in on that, Director? Sure. <laughs> yeah. It was before I came into the project. Yeah, so this has been going on for a long time. So I, I think what made us want to want to build it was actually Governor DeWine, right? He is he lives locally. He's one of your neighbors, part of the community, and he grew up in this area and heard all the stories, right? All the stories about the Shawnee who lived here, all the stories of his own ancestors. Um, 
you know, I mean, this is a place, so, so the movie you talked about, the working title of it now could change, but the working title is Crossroads of Cultures, because this is like in this unique, exciting period of time, this is where the Shawnee came together with the frontiersmen and the pioneers and the settlers. And so this story, I think, fascinated him for so long, and he became governor, and we got an opportunity to do it. I mean, I, I think some of you might be surprised around the entire state how much history is included in um, sites owned by the Department of Natural Resources. So, I, you know, you, you think of the Ohio History Connection as owning all these historic sites, but we have so many historic sites ranging from the 200-year-old Marblehead Lighthouse to Malabar Farm built by Louis Bromfield back in the 50s and all the history that's encapsulated there to a, a historic stone house at Salt Fork State Park. I mean, this state is covered with historic sites that are in state parks. So we were excited to have the opportunity to, to focus on one more. But the idea for it and the commitment for it came from Governor DeWine, for sure. Thank you. Well, if anybody else has any more questions, I'm sure we can stick around for a little bit. Um, um, we really appreciate everybody coming out today. I, like Melissa said, this is quite the showing. I was very impressed. So thank you for spending some time with us this Sunday afternoon. And uh, feel free to grab us as we take things down here and if you have any further questions. So thank you, everybody. Thank you all. I think this uh, just shows the turnout how excited people are about this uh, this facility. Uh, there's cookies and, uh, and lemonade or something in the back. So.